Welcome again to the second of our annual Moore College Lectures for 2022. Our special guest is Professor Kelly Capick from Covenant College in Georgia. That's right, she. And our theme, our topic for this year's series of lectures is a theology of the Christian life. Yesterday, Professor Capick centred and grounded the exploration in a key facet of Christian theology that God is love. And to have a theology of the Christian life means to know first the God of Christianity. And if God is love, then the Christian life is grounded in, centred on, governed by, and moving towards, in ever-increasing glory, the love that God is in himself. That's how we started uh, the morning lectures last week, and we will continue on uh, from that theme. Uh, Professor Capic gave us six propositions, uh, which he will uh, revisit four of those that we covered yesterday uh, before moving on for today. Now, just in terms of uh, more mundane things, you can see uh, we'll be using the Slider app again for question time today. Uh, the details, oh, there they are magically appearing on the screen. Uh, they'll be available for you, uh, our online audience as well. Uh, Professor Capic has kindly uh, volunteered, uh, kindly accepted the possibility of questions, and I will be uh, weeding out the knuckleheads as we go through. Uh, and I'm informed by uh, uh, William, our IT man, that we can in fact identify all the knuckleheads who put their anonymous <laughs> questions in. Uh, so you'll be receiving a notice in your uh, end of year examination results. <laughs> The uh, lectures are being recorded, even as they are live streamed. Hello to the uh, studio, the audience at home. We're not working with uh, outlines this year. That's why you can't find them on the website. But the uh, lectures are being recorded. Now, I think the last responsible thing I have to do here is, uh, before praying is read the Bible. And uh, Professor Capic has given us 1 John chapter 4, beginning at verse 15 today. 1 John chapter 4. I will read that uh, and pray, and then we'll hand over to uh, Professor Capic. One John chapter four, verse fifteen. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God remains in him, and he in God. And we have come to know and to believe the love that God has for us. God is love, and the one who remains in love remains in God, and God remains in him. In this Love is made complete with us so that we may have confidence in the day of judgment. Because as he is, so also are we in this world. There is no fear in love. Instead, perfect love drives out fear because fear involves punishment. So the one who fears is not complete in love. We love because he first loved us. If anyone says, I love God, and yet hates his brother or sister, he is a liar. For the person who does not love his brother or sister, whom he has seen, cannot love God, whom he has not seen. And we have this command from him. The one who loves God must also love his brother and sister. <clears throat> Friends, would you please join me as we pray? Our great God and loving Heavenly Father, we thank you for this new day. We thank you for the peace and prosperity that we enjoy such that we can gather uh, and commit this time in study of your word. We pray for our brother Kelly as he speaks. We ask, Lord, that you would empower him with your spirit to uh, refresh us, 
with your word, to enlighten us with your truth, uh, and to guide us towards the return of, in glory of our loving Saviour, Jesus the Christ. Amen. Amen. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Professor Kelly Kaplan. Good morning, gluttons for punishment. You're here for, I guess, actually the third, with Thursday being the first. Yesterday, as we started to think through the idea that God is love and what that means for us as we try and unpack a theology of the Christian life, for reminding you it's a theology of Christian life, which means we are fundamentally, first and foremost, talking about God before we talk about our lives. Um, we're trying to understand who this God is, what it means um, to be made by him, to live in response to him, and we've kind of been arguing for this simple but hopefully not simplistic idea that the Christian life is a response to the love of God, and we'll be continuing that this morning. So uh, if you don't mind, I'd like to pray as well. Our Father, we do thank you for this time together. We know that without the very presence and power of your spirit, these words will just float and then hit the ground. But by your spirit, the things of you can stir and awaken and comfort, convict and challenge and heal. So we pray that the things of you would make it through and the things that are not would dissipate in due time. Be with those who listen and the one who speaks in the name of Christ, amen. amen. So just to remind you what we were talking about last time, these, these propositions, as we've mentioned, I, uh, very quickly, number one was God is love. God is love. Number two is this idea that creation is the very overflow of the love of God, right? It is the overflow of God's love. God doesn't create because he has some need or or uh, uh, emptiness in him. It's actually the overflow of the fullness of God. Number three, then, means that creation is meant to both reflect and participate in God's love. Creation's very design, in light of these realities, it means that all of creation is meant to reflect and participate in God's love, and we call that shalom. Number four is the problem of sin, with, which disrupts and disorders love and shalom. This takes us to number five and where I will start today. Number five, to remind you, is this. The incarnate son, the incarnate son is both the embodiment and object of divine love. The incarnate son is both the embodiment and object of divine love. And you may remember last time I mentioned to you the 17th century Puritan John Owen, and really I'm picking up immediately from there, drawing from Owen on this very thing, because I think he has some difficult things to say, and I will be, I, I decided we're not going to get into all the weeds on them, but I, I want you to, there's some difficulties there, but there's also some fresh insight, I think, or refreshing insight in terms of the incarnation and how that helps us understand creation, fall, and restoration. Having affirmed, you may remember, that the eternal love of God, remember this language of ad intra, ad intra is God in himself, Father, Son, and Spirit from all eternity, in himself is love, this eternal love of God ad intra is full and complete, Owen turns his attention to the ad extra love. And I'll just warn you up front, part of what gets really challenging here is when you start to talk about God, you have the difficulties of talking about time and eternity. How does God relate to time and process and, and those kind of things? Um, so I just want to acknowledge that without trying to explain it all. But I want you to see how Owen tries to connect God's internal self-love, how he loves himself, with his love for creation. Here's the quote, the first one I want to give you. 
Here's what he says. The first act of the love of God the Father, where there is anything at extra. So let me make sure you're following. The first act of God the Father, where there is anything at extra, anything outside of God, well, let me use his language, where there, wherein there is anything at extra or without divine essence, first act of the love of God the Father, where there, there is anything that I got at extra without the divine essence, ready, is the person of Christ considered as invested with our nature. Considered as invested with our nature. Now, you may not have followed that or even under, I'll just tell you that is worth putting in a theological pipe and smoking it for a long time. And I hope to give you a sense of what I mean by that. Not about the smoking, but why it matters. Right? This, the, keep in mind, let me just make sure you, you're following. You know, we talk about creation a lot. The, the best definition I've come up with that I've been able to articulate what creation is, just to make sure we're all on the same page, creation by definition is everything that's not God. That's creation. It's not just the material world and our body. It's anything that's not God. And Owen here is saying that the first act of God's, the Father, toward what is not God is the person of Christ invested with our nature, which is creature, human nature. Now you have the eternal God who is himself love, first expressing his outward love towards creation by his love of Jesus. The incarnate Christ, the eternal son, assuming a full and true human nature. Owen here will talk about a first and a second creation. And part of it seems to be him reminding us in some ways that the truth is Adam and Eve are not the pinnacle of creation. Jesus is. He's, there's something anticipated here. They are made in God's image. Jesus is the image. They anticipated him, but he is the focus. He's the prototype of all of humanity. In this sense, the incarnate Christ has ontological priority over Adam and Eve, but also over everything else that God has made. Now, this is difficult, and I just as a heads up, I think the first part of this lecture is the most difficult, so hang with me. It's difficult for various reasons, because in the, it, the dominant Christian tradition, and Owen actually seems to affirm this, is that the idea is that the incarnation does not occur as a necessary part of God's creation, but in light of the fall. And yet, that starts to raise all these questions about God's relationship to time and process and how he knows. Um, and the short answer I want to tell you is this is primarily about kind of, um, it's not about chronology, right? And I just want to acknowledge that without trying to take you through all of this. But part of, part of the wrestling with what Owen is saying there, when he says the first act of God's love outside of his eternal self-love is the person of Christ considered with our nature, does he mean by that that the first ad extra act is loving Jesus Christ? Or does he mean that the first act of God's love outside of himself is the person of Christ, the very act of the divine uniting himself with the human, the union of the divine and the human. God, who is love, loves his created world, and that world is rightly ordered and represented most clearly in the incarnate Christ, who is the mediator. Tomorrow's talk will all be about the mediator, the singular incarnate son who extends himself who extends his self-love, uh, God's very self-love, to and for his creation. Part of what Owen is talking about here is that in these opening scenes in Genesis, God manifests his love in the original creation again and again. But what we find with the coming of Christ is that creator God's commitment to loving that creation even in light of 
of the depredations of sin. Here again is Owen. From the first eternal love of God proceeds all love that was in the first creation. And from the second love of God to the person of Christ as incarnate proceeds the love in the second creation. Part of what Owen is trying to do is figure out how you relate Genesis 1 and 2 to, say, Matthew chapter 1. How do we relate God's first ad extra love of creation in time and space with his very love in the event of the incarnation in Mary's womb? Here you talk about God's eternity and time. I'm going to skip a lot of those details where I decided we're not going to talk about Boethius, we're not going to talk about eternality, we're not going to talk about Eleanor Stump and the idea of time, because I, I can already tell this is difficult. But trust me, I told you we have to do some work, and at the end of this lecture, we'll finally get to what I would tell a seven or eight-year-old like Jonathan, my son. But this is, this is all related. I haven't forgotten that. But I will just tell you, there is, for Owen at least, in the tradition, there's a priority of place and love that's not determined by time. In other words, that gives priority not to a billion-year-old ba Big Bang or some prehistoric Homo sapiens, but to Jesus Christ, the Son incarnate. Right? The first act of the love of God the Father, wherein there is anything ad extra or without the divine essence, is the person of Christ considered as invested with our nature. This is not chiefly about chronology, but about priority, about purity, about telos, about goodness. Owen sees Christ as God's elect. Think Ephesians 1. He is God's elect and, and God's servant. This language may sound familiar to you in whom my soul delighteth. That actually comes from Isaiah 42, verse 1, right? The one in whom my soul delighteth. And what you find in the New Testament is that that Old Testament language is specifically applied to Christ two times. Once in Matthew 3, 17 at Jesus' baptism, and then later in Matthew 17 at the transfiguration, where you have God from the heavens, speaking these words of the Messiah and saying, this is the one in whom I rest, in whom I'm well pleased and delighted. And reflecting on that passage, Owen, following a fairly common Puritan tradition and throughout the history of the church, uses what you might call a sanctified imagination, and he puts words into the, into the mouth of the Father. These aren't, these aren't in the New Testament, but he thinks it fairly represents what is being said there. And Owen calls these emphatical words. Listen to what he says. <clears throat> Let the sons of humanity, this is him imagining basically what you should be hearing with the voice of the Father over the incarnate Son. Let the sons of humanity take notice of this, that the infinite love of my whole soul is fixed on the person of Jesus Christ as incarnate. The Messiah is the Son of the Father, who's been given everything by the Father. So out of his love for the Son, the Father shows him everything. John 3 and John 5. The Father identifies and invests the incarnate Son as the great embodiment and expression of the eternal love of God made manifest in the flesh. Christ the complete, as Owen says, adequate object of the Father's love. God, who in all eternity rests in his own triune life and love, that love that overflows to creation, now is here portrayed fully resting in the goodness of his creation, but not in a generic way. God's love rests and is actualized in the incarnate Son who assumes a specific human nature. The incarnate God manifests his own life and love, uniting the deity with humanity in the person of Christ. All right, we're about where I can, you can breathe and we'll, we'll get. But to, what this means is to understand God or his creation. Let me say this again. To understand God and to understand his creation, 
especially in our sin-stained world, you must look to Christ for both of those. You must look to Christ who embodies and reveals God's love. And theologically, we must conform our methods and our theology to Christ in order to understand and describe. I mentioned and spent a lot of time yesterday on shalom, but shalom can be a shibboleth. It can be a buzzword. It can mean anything you want it to mean. But the reality is, no, 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 no. Shalom is understood in light of Christ. If you want to understand shalom, in terms of God and the rest of creation, we look to Christ. Only by this consistent conformity with the incarnation can the Christian imagination take proper form. So this takes me to my last observation, but there are subpoints, And this will take some time. Number six, loving the incarnate Christ necessarily means loving God and his creation. Loving the incarnate Christ necessarily means loving God and his creation. Maybe next time I won't even start with the jacket. <laughs> we'll just stop pretending. <laughs> How does it come about that we love God and his creation? I actually do think, experientially and otherwise, that we learn to love by experiencing love. We learn to love by experiencing love. And in this case, there's no generic spirituality. I'm not interested in vague religion. We need a Christ-centered faith that is immersed in the love of the Father and empowered and comforted by the Spirit. And I will, I'm, what I'm arguing here is that we are able to love God because we get caught up in the action of the love that occurs between the Father for the Son and the Spirit. Our love for Christ, therefore, carries in its nature the love of the Father and this love for everything that the Father loves, including the created world. So let's start with this idea that loving Christ is loving God. Loving Christ is loving God. I want to read you another quote from Owen. Today is Owen Day. Suck it up. It's okay. Here's what he says. Proportional to the renovation of the image and likeness of God upon any of our souls... Right, The degree to which you're, you image and, and are like God in our souls is our love to Jesus Christ. He that knows Jesus Christ most is most like unto God. For there the soul of God rests. There the complacency of God. There is the complacency of God. And if we would be like God, it must be in gracious exercise of our love to the person of Jesus Christ. Do you track with that at all? I want to make sure. Okay. I've made you work hard. Here we go. I, I need you to follow this. When are you most like God? You're most like God when you're loving Christ. I want you to think about that. What Owen is saying is you never reflect God more, you're never more like God than in your love of Christ. This is, a, this is an incredible thing, right? He who loves Jesus Christ most is most like unto God because they're the very, remember the Isaiah 42 one applied to Christ, they're the very love of God, the delight of God rests on Christ incarnate, on Messiah. His love rests on the incarnate Son, and our love rests on the incarnate Son. God and humanity meet in loving Christ, who is unique in all of reality. There is none other who is truly God and truly man in one person. Just by the way, that's kind of why you shouldn't talk about incarnational ministry. If I get myself in trouble. I mean, I, I love what, you mean, what we mean by incarnational ministry, but there's only one incarnation. And all of you're never more like God than when you're loving Christ incarnate. Now, I want to give you a couple bullet points. Well, like six of them real quick. I'm not going to repeat them all. Um, 
But I, I want you to kind of see how I'm working through this so I can push on, just the logic of it. First, God is love, so as Jesus, uh, God is love, so Jesus as God the Son incarnate is literally the embodiment of God's love. He is the embodiment of God's love. Second, since the activity between the Father and Son and the Spirit is always love, Jesus as the incarnate Son is always the object of God's love. That doesn't change. This is an eternal love. God doesn't, the Father doesn't start loving the Son at incarnation. Third, Jesus Christ is God's revelation of himself to us, right? Jesus is God's great self-revelation. The place scripture points us, think Hebrews 1, in the past, but now. So to learn who God is, where do we look? Jesus. He himself is the criterion of our knowledge of God and for all methods of gaining knowledge about God. This is partly why we don't just buy into a kind of a universal religion. Christ is not just an example. He is the great self-revelation of God. Next, because he's fully human, as well as truly God or fully God, Jesus the Messiah is the pattern for us to follow in knowing how to be fully human. If you want to know what it means to be human, don't just spend your time trying to figure out the difference between, say, Adam and animals in Genesis. Look to Jesus to know what it means to be fully human. Next, because he is the Logos from the beginning, that is, eternally begotten without, therefore, a beginning. He is the very source of our being in humanity, and he himself is the source of our love, of our loving. He's the source of our love, our loving. Next, just two more of these. He is love incarnate, and therefore, the proper object and goal of our love. He is love incarnate, and therefore the proper object and goal of love. So then finally, Christian life recognizes in Christ, in Christ, the inbreaking of shalom. Because here we experience the love and life we've been invited to participate in, in this inbreaking of shalom even in this fallen and hurting world. Now, I covered a lot there, but I just wanted you to kind of see the logic of what's going on here. The God who is love, as you know, creates out of the overflow of his love. That's very important because the work of recreation is not God going, <clears throat> I got to love again. The work of recreation is not a new love of God. One of the challenges I see in a lot of our evangelical circles is we do not create to connect the God of creation with the God of recreation, which is partly why we end up in some problematic spiritualizing of the Christian life. And, it, and, and our view of the Christian life doesn't have much to do with creation. But the God who loves what he made is committed to loving it back and to remaking it in and through the incarnate Son. This is the very embodiment and object of love. True shalom, though, is manifest in the kingdom of God. Therefore, true shalom always centers on the Son incarnate. He is the unique place where God's love and our love meet. The Father loves the incarnate Son, and we respond to his self-revelation by loving Christ. Owen goes on, he says, we don't love God, listen to this, we don't love God immediately as God, but our love to God is exercised in and by Christ. We believe in and through Christ. We live in love through Christ and by the Spirit. And then again, Owen, here is the trial. 
So here he's saying, here's a test case. Try this on. See how this fits. And I, I was alluding to this. Here is the trial of our return to God and of our renovation in, in his image in us, namely in our love to Jesus Christ. In our love to Jesus Christ. There God and man do meet. There God and his church above and below center. Right? Loving Christ is the very center. It's where God and humanity meet, where the church above and church below gather and center. Christ, the embodiment and object of God's love, God draws us to himself in and through Christ. Owen talks about this, about how Christ is this attractive power, and he draws on John 12, of the one who is the lifted up one. And this attractive power is not just, he doesn't just attract us to him, the lifted up one as the, the very object of God's love and, and man, uh, uh, manifestation of God's love. It's not just an initial attraction, but as Owen will argue, that the love of Christ draws our souls continually nearer to him. So God's love in Christ is not just get, to get you to become a Christian, but by gazing and meditating and, and experiencing the love of Christ. That is also how we experience renewed nearness to God. So the great expression of Christian life is loving Christ. It's Christian life. This love from and to the incarnate, incarnate Son is what constitutes and explains Christian life. And only in and through Christ can we live in the kingdom of shalom, which means this loving communion with God, neighbor, earth, and even within ourselves. This takes us to the final step. Loving, that doesn't mean we're almost done. <laughs> loving our neighbors and creation. Loving our neighbors and creation. I want to spend more time on this because in some ways, Maybe I'm wrong. Things I've said so far, maybe you're, you're like, yeah, I kind of get that. Um, but I want us to think through this more, especially the second half of this idea. So for the first idea of loving our neighbors because of loving Christ or experiencing Christ's love, as was read earlier, the Apostle John consistently makes these connections as an example. Just Get it in your head, right? Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God, and whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love does not know God because God is love. Did you hear that? It didn't say anyone who does not pass their New Testament Greek test does not love God. And you all know you can ace your education at more. And if you are a cruel, hard-hearted person, that degree does nothing for you. John is very clear. The sign of loving God is not the amount of data you and I can say. It's love. And I know we know that, but let it, listen to John elsewhere. A little later, he says, Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought to love the people we would like to love. No, that's not what he says. <laughs> we ought to love one another. And in case we missed it, then he, he later adds, We love, why? Because he first loved us. So if anyone says, I love God and hates his brother or sister, he's a liar. That's brutal. For he who does not love his brother or sister who he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. According to John, God's love made manifest in the person and work of Christ by its very nature is meant to produce a responsive love in us, a love of God and neighbor. It's not a model of debt repayment, right, in which God's done something for us, and so now, kind of in response, we, we have to pay back this debt of love to God by our good deeds or something like that. No, 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 that perverts, misunderstands the whole thing. The reason the love of God has all these relational consequences 
is because the God of creation is the same as the God of recreation. And so experiencing the, the love of God who loved his original creation, as we experience his love of recreation, it should have not just vertical consequences, but horizontal consequences. Being reconciled to God includes being brought back into the stream of divine love and goodness, the goodness of shalom. So that the spirit of Christ reshapes our lives and our loves. He remakes us so that we not only then rightly relate to him, but to our neighbor, to the earth, even to ourselves. In the 14th century, Julian of Norwich, I spent a bunch of time with her this last year, well, you know what I mean by that. Spent a bunch of time reading her work. And if you've never read her before, there are some things in there, especially as a Protestant, you're like, mm, wish she didn't say that. She is worth learning from. She is worth learning from. I'll just give you one thing she said that was brilliant on this. She said, he makes us to love all that he loves because of his love. He makes us to love all that he loves because, he I mean, just think about it in your own life, right? Some of you, you know, are dating or you, whatever, you're married and, or, or, or deep friendships. And one of the things that starts to happen in that relationship, things that you never, you know, in, in fact, uh, Chase was telling me recently, like, hey, like his wife is totally in to Australian rules football now, right? So we're out in downtown, you know, and he's getting a call from his wife with an update on the game. But years before, she didn't even know what that was. But I, it sounds like it started as, as our son was getting involved, she got involved, and what he loved became genuinely her love. Not just that she's loving it because he loved it, but now it's her love. Right? And uh, Julian is saying, because of God's love, has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit. Oh, well, that's not her. <laughs> this is John. Sorry. It's the next line. <laughs> Here's John's version of what I, I, I'm getting at. Because of God's love that's been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit, who's been given to us. We love the thing God loves. I spent a lot of time with Augustine yesterday. Now it's time to dive into some Augustine here. Augustine writes about the implications of this love for the rest of creation. With God as the source of all love and also the final object or destination of love. And Augustine makes a distinction, and I really wrestled with him on this. So I'm telling you that up front because my guess is this is just going to sound offensive to you up front. But hang with me. Augustine distinguishes what he calls uti, U-T-I, uti, which means use, and frui, F-R-U-I, uti and frui. Frui means enjoyment. You can translate it as enjoyment. Uti and frui. Here's what Augustine says. God alone is to be enjoyed. Frui. God alone is to be enjoyed while creation is meant to be used. That just sounds terrible, doesn't it? So we're going to have to talk through this a little bit. God alone is to be enjoyed. Creation is to be used. That language understandably grates on our modern ears. But having spent a lot of time with him on this, I, wanna, I, I think his point is quite profound and right, even though the language can be a little bit challenging for us. So let's work through it. Part of the reason this is difficult for us is our modern sensibilities in our ears and how that language is used. You may know Immanuel Kant and his ethical imperative, the idea that we should treat people, right, not as means to an end, but as ends. You don't use people. And so with that very strong, whether or not you've ever heard of Kant, you kind of have inhabited, you've received this idea that we sh and which is a good idea, by the way, don't use people. Okay, just to be clear, like, only thing I learned today is Catholic thinks just use people, it's fine, it's Christian. And that's not what I'm saying. But, but as Mario uh, um, Nadal Natalini says, 
and kind of makes this distinction. For Kant, his ethical framework is purely imminent. Now, I'm aware, and Nadali is aware, that the reality is Kant does have this place for kind of judgment to make sense of ethics, but he doesn't really do much with it, and he's like, I don't really know, but it's just kind of there. But really, by and large, Kant, Kant's is an imminent, the realm of ends, whereas Augustine has this transcendent and metaphysical approach. And so if you confine your ethical analysis to the imminent, to the this-worldly framework, you can't really refute what Kant is saying, or at least it, it becomes very difficult. But if our considerations require us to look beyond the imminent, then some other things open up. Kant's maxim that, that people are ends and not means to other ends must be reconsidered only if you have a much more expansive view of reality. And that is what's happening with Augustine. The creator-creature difference means that God's love for us and our love for him are of different kinds, not merely of size, than are even our love for one another. Here, let me, let me try and make this more clear. Kant is rightly warning us against using people. But what if, what if the true and final end of love isn't a created person or object, but God himself? Using that language which is so hard for us in Augustine, he doesn't mean, generously interpreted, he doesn't mean you should love people less, which is what we, you know, if we say you're, you're using someone, that's never a compliment. That means you're, you're loving them, you're not loving them well or, or at all. Augustine actually thinks this elevates people and objects. Because for Augustine, enjoyment consists to clinging to something lovingly for its own sake, whereas use always points beyond that thing, person or object, to something beyond it. And what Augustine is trying to get at is that loving our neighbors is a way of loving God. Loving our neighbors as a way of loving God it can increase quantitatively and deepen qualitatively our love for our neighbors. For Augustine, he says, the things that are to be enjoyed are the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. In fact, the Trinity, the one supreme being. Because God is love. He's the one ultimately to be enjoyed. Okay, let me make sure you get in. So the basic idea is, despite the language, is just God is the one worthy of enjoyment and ultimate love because he's the source of all of that love. So that when we love, delight, even enjoy creaturely aspects of the creaturely world, that's not a bad thing, but they were never meant to be the end of that love. And when you try and make creaturely objects, whether things or people, the end of love, rather than a conduit taking you to the very source of love, then a good thing becomes a problem. Let's keep thinking through this. The Apostle Paul, you know, in his, his doxology, in Romans eleven thirty six, 36, Paul says that all things, as you know, are from him, through him, and to him. And thus he ends, to him be glory forever. All things are from him, through him, and to him. Paul's point, let's be clear, is not that mountains are unimpressive. It's not that puppies can't be celebrated. It's not that sex is terrible or children shouldn't be loved. That's offensive to the creator. And when that stuff seeps into the Christian tradition where we start to belittle the goods of creation, that's a problem. That's not the... But as Augustine is trying to remind us, these wonderful things and experiences are gifts. They're all gifts from God. They're all meant to be enjoyed with God, who takes us back to God. 
So when you're watching the rugby match, it's not that you're doing something unspiritual. When you're enjoying a good meal, God is with you in this. This is a gift from him to be enjoyed with him, to be taken back and praised to him. This is what's going on in Augustine's uti frui distinction. Like the Apostle Paul, this problem of the flesh and the spirit. When Paul talks about the flesh and the spirit, he is not, as I'm sure you know, he is not pitting the spiritual and the material. It is not the physical versus the non-physical. For Paul, the flesh and spirit represent two ways of living, two approaches to life. The flesh is a life lived by reducing everything to the created order, to the material world, to the animal nature. It's a life lived in rebellion against God, kind of denying his presence, his power, his goodness. That's life reduced to the flesh. Life in the spirit is a life not anti-physical. It's a life lived in touch with God by his spirit. His spirit dwelling in us, not belittling the material world or our physical bodies, but informing how we live in faith, hope, and love. Living, as you know, living by the flesh hardens our hearts, dims our vision, limits our imagination to this world. And so we try and satisfy our deepest longings and desires that were meant to be satisfied in God alone. When we treat good gifts as ultimate ends, when you treat good gifts as ultimate ends, they disappoint. In fact, good gifts turn out to be terrible masters. Properly loving the created world acknowledges the, its finite ability to satisfy. In other, to put it simply, we should never confuse the gifts with the giver. You and I have been given gifts to enjoy in order that we might enjoy the giver, right? Just just imagine when you you give a child a gift, what do you think as a parent, right, or a a cousin or whatever, you you give someone a gift, and when you give them the gift, they're like, "Mm." they don't look at it, they don't acknowledge it. That's kind of a problem, isn't it? What if they're like, no, no, I don't care about the gifts, I just care about you. You're like, no, but I gave you this gift. You you want, say, the child to delight in the gift. And you will find very often you give a a child a gift, and at its best moment, as they're enjoying it, they look up and say what? Thank you. They're enjoying that, and their gaze is, is they are enjoying the gifts, which is actually helping them and cultivating them a love of the giver. Now, in, uh, these kind of things, we'd, we'd really want to unpack them. But let me, let me ask you this question. Let me maybe jump to this. Can you love your spouse too much? I find, you know, my wife and I have been married 30 years this year. And one of the things we've been involved in is, is doing premar- you know, uh, actually we do young married counseling. We don't do premarital counseling because it's all, everyone just imagines, blah, blah, blah. But once they're married, now we can talk, right? And then it was like, oh, well, this is kind of hard. Like, what? So we leave it to the other pastors to do the premarital stuff, and then all of a sudden we jump in with the, that first year of marriage, right? So, but, but sometimes you'll hear, you know, zealous Christians, maybe you've thought this, maybe you've said this, but you'll think, like, I'm really worried I love my spouse too much. Is that possible? Let me just tell you right now, I think that's impossible. Some of you are parents, and you are worried that you love your children too much. I'm just going to tell you right now, you cannot love your children too much. You cannot love your child too much. What about your puppy? You cannot 
Love your puppy too much. What about Legos? You cannot love Legos too much. Now, I know what's going on there, but your problem, and this is very important to me and theologically, the reason why I say that, you're like, you're immediately thinking, but Capic, what about idolatry? You end up in idolatry not because you love something too much, but too little or inappropriately. It is not when, when a young couple says, I think, when someone says, I think I love my spouse too much, I'm just telling you, you don't love them too much, but you are seeking something out of that relationship that's not the proper function and form of love, and that's where it becomes idolatry. You are seeking to make your spouse satisfy all your deepest longings and desires. That is not lo you loving them too much. It is you not loving them well. You can't love a puppy too much. But if you try and invest that puppy with all of your life's meaning and worth, you will get a dysfunctional puppy. <laughs> that was easier to say than the next part. You can't love your children too much. But I'm sure many in this room have experienced in one form or another what happens when a parent or parents put all the weight of the world on that child. And that child must meet all of their needs. And you live vicariously through that child. That is not loving this child too much. That is treating that child poorly. That is asking that child to be God. You cannot love the child too much, but you can not love that child. And asking that child to be God to you, that is idolatry. But that's not love. That's a deformation of love. And it's very important for me to say that because otherwise, Christian, if, until you understand that theologically, your answer to, will be, okay, I think I might be loving this, my spouse too much, so the answer is to love them less? I'm just going to say, it. that's stupid. And it's definitely not Christian. No, 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 no. It, the problem is if we treat them as ultimate ends. Beloved, you and I don't generate love. This is part of what's different about us as Christians. We don't actually think we are generating love. We are participating in it. This love goes back to God, the eternal triune God, who from all eternity has loved, and through the overflow of his love has created the world, and so that when we love, we are participating in God's love. This is why in our marriages, we don't think marriage is merely two people making a commitment to each other, because I don't care how good your marriage is, it ain't gonna work. Because there will be days when you wake up and you're like, eh, I don't think I love that person anymore. Oh, but the love is deeper than us. The love is not contingent upon my feelings for that person. It is very, it is this covenantal, it is God's love that we're invited into. Love is a stream of water moving from God, through God, to God. So that in all of creation, we can praise him and we can participate in his love. We are not the ones who are generating it. I got way away from the notes. <laughs> we love, it, this even affects how we love ourselves. Let me conclude. I started yesterday, yesterday by telling you about my son Jonathan when he was about seven or eight, when he said that night, I know I love you and mama. I don't know if I love God. I don't even know what it would mean to love God. And I don't really know what it means for God to love me. What do we think about that? And someone asked, well, what did you say to Jonathan? That was a great theological question he had. And as my wife and I considered it and thought through it, basically we started to talk to him about times when he and I would be wrestling on the ground 
having this joy and delight, when he would laugh uncontrollably with his sister, when he delights in his mother's approval or snuggles with Ruby or Labradoodle, giggling over tickles, tasting a cold orange on a hot summer day. During all of those times, we would occasionally just pause and go, this is God's love. Does that make you nervous? If, if that sounds wrong to you, you've probably over-spiritualized the faith. An, a, a cold orange on a hot summer day? That's the love of God. Snuggles with your puppy is the love of God. And the idea is he starts to realize all this goodness around him points back to God's love. But God's love does not, as you know, simply get reduced to moments of delight. Not just when good things and helpful things happen, but even in great moments of need. And even seven-year-olds have often experienced some sense of sadness and pain in the world. Right? And they have also very often had a sense that their own hearts can sometimes be cruel or negligent. And so we can say, no, no, God's love can be found here too. And we talk about Christ, that our Creator didn't abandon us to sin and misery, He, he didn't abandon us to our tantrums and to our greed, He came to us in Christ to reconnect us to himself, to reconnect us to all that's good in his world. Jesus is the center of love. Jesus is the center of love, and we can love him as we delight in his gifts. Whether those gifts are the forgiveness of sins or playing with Legos. Because all true love ultimately comes from God and leads us back to him. Loving the creator and loving his created world are meant to go together. Paul says, set your minds on things above and not on earthly things. You might think that counters what's being said here. No, no, no. He is not disparaging God's creation. He is pointing us to Christ. Paul explains, and I'm just about done, he explains that he means here, that we are to put to death evil actions and attitudes and slander and wrath, covetousness, sexual immorality, evil desire. Why are we supposed to put all those things to death? Because those things oppose God and his good creation. You know this, right? God doesn't, God doesn't the law is not God like, I'm just going to make up some crazy stuff because I just want to see if people will listen to me. If that's your view of the law, no wonder. Like, do you think Jesus is just going around doing a checklist and like, okay, I did that, I did that, I did that? No, no, no. No, these things are wrong because they oppose the good God who made a good world. They oppose love. They oppose shalom. But by keeping your mind on Christ, which is the things above, we connect ourselves to God and to his world. Interesting. By connecting the things above, we connect to God and his world. You know what that looks like? Listen to what Paul says. He explains it. Compassion, humility, meekness, patience, etc. Attitudes and actions that nurture shalom through divine love. Beloved, loving God is far from rejecting his creation. It involves recognizing God's presence and work throughout it. And loving Christ means that we can love not just our friends, but even our enemies. It means breathing deeply the very oxygen of God's love so that we can, in a small but significant way, push back against the darkness of sin and brokenness in our world. It means pointing others to Christ because we want them to encounter love, to encounter God himself. For that to happen, we must take them to Jesus, the incarnate son, where the love of God and the love of humanity are meant to meet. Let's pray.
Again, Father, this is a lot. But we do long, even imperfectly, to bask in your love. We long for that love to radiate through our lives so that we might be quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to become angry. That we would be ambassadors of Christ, doing the work of reconciliation, being about, by your spirit, spreading pockets of shalom in the midst of a broken, rebellious, and fallen world. But on our own, none of this can happen. Lift our gaze from our sin to your love. We pray in the name of the risen King. Amen. Professor Capic uh, has agreed to answer some questions for us, but I think you should take a moment to reflect on what you've heard, just quietly to yourself. Look over what you thought you heard and what you've taken a note of. And then we'll have a little bit of a moment to share with each other, uh, and then we'll seek to clarify uh, the things that uh, Professor Capic has said. But for now, be quiet and reflect on what you've heard. Okay, <laughs> thank you. That should have given the baby boomers in the audience enough time to work a QR code. <laughs> it's just me, actually. <laughs> Question number one. The Christian life is sounding very middle class. How does the Christian in poverty and difficult relationships, without these gifts of God, learn to love God? That is a great question. A view of the Christian life cannot be a view that's like an affluent middle class for it to be Christian life. So... That is definitely not what I'm presenting. That's, and that's very interesting. So I want to, let's think through this a little bit. So I, I wrote, um, some of you know the economist Brian Ficker. He wrote a book called When Helping Hurts. Maybe you've heard of that book. That's on poverty. And he and I wrote a follow-up a few years ago called Becoming Whole, Why the Opposite of Poverty Isn't the American Dream. And it's actually us addressing that very question, whoever just asked that. Because what's happened in much of the church, certainly in America, as was when we try and deal with poverty, what we found is even in the church, what is being given to people is not so much a clear vision of the kingdom, but more like a vision of the American dream. So that is actually not what I'm interested in all, in at all. Having said that, part of what we have to understand is even people who are materially poor have gifts, right? Part of the challenge when you deal with poverty of alleviation, one of the problems both in the church and outside of the church is when we think we, the ones who are giving, have all of the wisdom and gifts and they are simply receiving. But instead, it needs to be more asset-driven where what, what we mean by that is given the presumption that God is love and has given everyone good gifts, Part of what we need to see is what, what do these materially poor people have that the world and the church are impoverished because they're not being able to utilize and cultivate. But the point is it can't just be one is giving and the one is taking, but is this mutual kind of thing. So this idea of love is crucial. So, for example, um, there's a homeless ministry my wife and I work with. And Markel, who helps lead this ministry, has no education, and he himself was homeless for 21 years, heavily addicted um, to drugs. And Mar Markel leads this ministry, not because he has a lot of resources, 
But because he has so experienced the love of God, he is driven to extend that love to others who are in his former situation. And for him, that constantly means both giving and providing material needs and providing the truths about who Christ is and and God's very love. Because you know who finds it, I actually think we all find it difficult to believe that God is love. But it's very difficult, and maybe this is behind the question, it's very difficult to believe that God is love when you've been sexually abused. It's very difficult to believe that God is love when you've been abandoned, when your parents have been cruel, or when you don't know where the next meal is. So actually, what I'm trying to argue here is, in a theology of Christian life, the answer to those deep questions is not to tell them, no, 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 the world isn't as bad as you think it is. It's not to say, I know you were sexually abused, but look, here's a good part of it. No. No, no, no. What Calvin says is faith is is the assured confidence of the love of God that, well, how, how am I going to say this? How does he say this? It is the assured, and now I'm confusing the Heidelberg Catechism with Calvin. He says, <laughs> faith, faith is the assurance of God's beneficence toward us. That's what he says. Calvin says, faith is the assurance of God's benefic- beneficence toward us, right? that God is, is kind towards us. And the question is, how do you believe that God is kind towards you? And Calvin's a good theologian, so he says, of God's benevolence towards us as seen in Christ. When you are materially poor, when you have been abused, when you have been neglected, you do not try and tell people about God's love by just trying to make everything sound good. You take them to him who is crucified the very embodiment of God's love. You take them to the bleeding and weeping Savior. This is God's love. That is a love that reaches all of us, no matter where we're at, materially or otherwise. And that is a love that transforms individuals and communities. So there's a lot more I'd probably want to say on that, but it's the right question if in the end, this is a theology of that, that Christian life is like a, an affluent middle-class life, that's a huge problem because the majority of the church through the world and throughout history has not been that. So that's not actually what I'm aiming for. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Now, you've been uh, directing us towards uh, Christ to understand God's love. Uh, the question is, Your Christology seems very weighted to the incarnation. What happened to the atonement and the resurrection, as in uh, Romans 1, 4, etc.? Yeah. Yeah, so I've definitely been emphasizing incarnation. It's because I'm talking to Protestants, if you want to be honest. So I believe, as Paul said, you know, preach Christ and him crucified. And, but as Richard Gaffin and others have pointed out, it's very interesting. Sometimes when we've taken statements like that, we've, we've talked all about the cross and we underemphasize, as Gaffin talks about, we underemphasize the resurrection. But when you see even in Paul in the New Testament, the resurrection is absolutely crucial. So to emphasize the cross is not, you cannot belittle the resurrection. But At the same time, one of the things I have found is that, well, let me put it this way. One New Testament scholar said, in the Reformation, the Reformers had very good answers to the question, I agree with this, why did Jesus die? But they had less able answers to the question, why did Jesus live? I actually think when you read Calvin, when you read Owen, they have robust incarnational theologies. This whole idea of prophet, priest, and king. Um, And the whole life of Christ matters. But those matter in order to even rightly affirm the cross. Otherwise, it is a real question. Like, why doesn't 
Why doesn't the sun just become, you know, come down? God can do anything, right? So why doesn't he just show up as a 30, 33-year-old, jump on a cross and deal with things? Why does that very life matter? And I, I think you cannot properly understand the death of Christ until you start to really glory in the life of Christ. And then the death of Christ takes on not less meaning, but more meaning. Similarly, I would actually say only when you start to really appreciate incarnation can... One of the reasons why we neglected resurrection is because we neglect incarnation. And so here, let me just, this is all too hypothetical. Let me, let me be more practical, since especially a lot of you are going to be ministers. Here's the test case. If you focus on the cross to the neglect of the others, the sign is the only thing you tell the people of God is your sins are forgiven. Does Kelly think God forgives sins in Christ? Yes. Okay, what I'm about to say does not undermine that. But beloved, the good news is not, is not only that your sins are forgiven. It's not less than your sins are forgiven. But it's not only that your sins are forgiven. The good news is Christ died and rose. The good news is our sins have been put to death and we are made alive in Christ that we might do good work. Which, you know, read Titus if you think that's bad or Paul in, in Ephesians. I mean, you, you know this, right? If, if you think telling Christians, not in a mean way, not in a manipulative way, like, but you were made for good works, that's not about like paying God back. No, no, no. It's because we're creatures made by a good God who knows how he made humans, which means the point of forgiveness in Christ crucified is that we might live in Christ risen. So if there's never anything to say besides you're forgiven, you can forgive your people for at some point wondering, then does the Christian life between conversion and death matter? Beloved, it does matter. Because we bear aroma of Christ in a world reeking of death and pain and sin. And I think the reason, part of why we neglect the resurrection and don't know how to handle works or, or, or Christian life well is because we've undervalued creation and that comes through in our undervaluing incarnation. That, I am not taken away from the death of Christ. He who knew no sin became sin, that we might become the righteousness of God. But if you want to know what the righteousness of God looks like, look to Christ and his life. Anyways, just, yeah. <laughs> you get me started. I can't. I'm sorry. Yeah, I'm looking for a more boring question now. <laughs> Stop being a knucklehead James Rigetti. <laughs> I didn't write that. <laughs> and it's Reverend James Rigetti, actually. <laughs> Okay, uh, changing tack a little bit. Could you say more uh, about how snuggling a puppy or experiencing pain manifests love for God? Mm. Uh, for example, do we need to be conscious of God in those moments to love him? Boy, that's, that's a good question. I think I'd, I'd want to think through that more. I actually don't think I want to say, and we probably have to talk about this more, I don't think I'd want to say you have to be conscious of it at that moment. Because my concern with trying to say you actually have to be conscious of it is the potential problem with what Augustine is saying. Then all of a sudden, you're not actually loving your wife or your child if the only thing you can think about it for it to be really love is God, then you're, you're losing those things. So it's not that. It is more like what we're saying with, with my son Jonathan. Sometimes after, sometimes during, sometimes after, sometimes before, it's just raising our awareness like, oh, that was God. Oh, this does draw me to God. It's some of that. It's just, it's, it's part of my attempt. What I, it's just to say, listen, guys, listen, guys. 
it's not just your quiet time that's spiritual, right? This is God's world. And we've got to be careful about fragmenting our lives and saying, well, this is God time. Now I'm at the rugby match, right? Or, and now I'm, I'm doing this, or now I'm doing, no, no, no. All things from him, through him, to him. So, but I don't think that means you have to consciously be thinking about it all the time, because I think that can end up in, in some issues. No, 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 no. <laughs> I'm just trying to keep it go from theme to theme. Uh, let's. There's a lot of uh, requests for tips or dot points or things like that. Uh, any tips on fostering love in Christ in the midst of sometimes dry academic study? Yeah, that's a great. That's a great question. I, uh, first thing I tell you is. Here's a little insider information. That's not just hard for you as students. It's hard for the faculty, right? One, one of the challenges is, I remember someone saying, when you do what we do for a living as pastors, as theologians, biblical scholars, said you, you either lose your job or you lose your faith kind of thing, right? It's a, it, there's something, a challenge with constantly holding these sacred things. Um, so I just think part of it is acknowledging that. Um, and I actually think cultivating a sense of vulnerability and honesty is super helpful, especially in settings like this, because, and this will help you prepare for the actual church, because right now, we, you know, in this setting, it's very common to feel attention to be spiritual, and in, if you don't learn to have people that you trust to be honest with them about some of the dryness, some of the struggles... That's not going to get better when you're in a church. It's going to get worse. You'll get more isolated. So I do think it is, um, I think, cultivating not having a ton of friends, that, which is unrealistic, but having some people that you trust. And that often means vulnerability. Um, but I also think, I, in terms of actual tips, things like I actually think silence is really important. Solitude is really important. And especially in a season like this, because by and large, my guess is you guys don't need more study, even probably more of the word. I'm not belittling the word. I'm in it every day. But by and large, your problem isn't. It, what, what happens, my guess is many of you know this, you're finding it difficult to read the Bible in any way of intimacy. It's all technical. So you have a lot going on in your head and your heart. And I think one of the hardest things for us as Christians, especially in this kind of setting, is being quiet. And I find there are few things that are scarier than being quiet with God. Because often when we're quiet, the accusations come. Whether it's from the devil, from our own hearts, we wonder where God is, all of that. But I would encourage you to practice solitude and quiet with God and let the things come and lay it at Christ's feet. Let the accusations come. But what I'm trying to say is, don't give up on prayer. Prayer is so vital, but you can't make prayer about efficiency. It really takes time just being with God. And, and so... There is something just fundamentally inefficient about the Christian life because there's something fundamentally inefficient about love. Love is not efficient, right? Those of you with new, you know, I remember you know, talking to someone who just had a newborn and they were like, the baby's going to be born in a month and then we're going to Europe and we're going to do all this ministry and it was their first born. I was like, yeah, that's going to work. <laughs> and sure enough, two months in, they're just dying. Well, because... This baby is needy, right? Needs love. Well, anyways, love requires attention, requires time. And as John, we keep reading John during this week, love is the test, not, not just head knowledge. So you need space. The last thing I'll say is Soren Kiergaard once said, 
I can tell the jet lag. I'm not getting quotes here right. But Soren Kierkegaard said, basically, those who are busy seldom have the ability to form a heart. That's what he said. Those who are busy seldom form the ability to have a heart. If you're going into ministry, you need a heart. And a heart requires time with God. It requires time where you can be thinking about others and growing in empathy. That just takes time. So, yeah. Something in there. How much have you got left? Right. It's up to you. I'll give you. We got another five. Let's go. Okay, this runs up the charts with the bullets. Uh, and I'm assuming that this has been asked in good faith. <laughs> if everything's going to be judged and burn, shouldn't we devote all our efforts to evangelism rather than enjoying creation? Great question. I don't know exactly where more is at on these issues. It is a much longer conversation, but yeah, part of what you would have to wrestle through is what does it mean that everything is going to be burned? Is that a purifying? And the short answer I would say is, I, I think, I actually do, I, and I know that's common, um, I think that's an overly narrow view of the Christian life. And I think it stems from, here's the question, do we actually believe that the God of creation is the God of recreation? Do we believe that God, as he made it, was like, oh, that's good, oh, that's good, Oh, that's good. Oh, that's good. Sin is not good. Does the God of creation, who calls it all good and loves it, now have no interest in it? Or, it's the book of Revelation, is heaven coming down to earth? And will it be burned and purified? So, Yes, there is the danger of making the things of this world into idols. But I think too often in Christian circles, that means it's never appropriate to love creation. And I will just tell you, as I hinted at yesterday, I know that sounds spiritual, but what if actually you're dishonoring God with that attitude? What if actually you're belittling, you and I are belittling, the creator. God is interested and cares about souls. And the God who is interested and cares about souls and salvation is never less than the creator. That's what I'd say. All right. Well, uh, we'll take this last one because uh, it's belligerently uh, at the top of the list here. To finish off, uh, what are your top five questions to ask in the doctrine of creation? Top five analytical questions in the doctrine of creation. Uh, yeah, I, that's, a, that's a good question. I'd have to think through it. But they would be things like, what does it mean to be human? Um, why, what does God think of the material world? What does God think of our bodies? Um, I was talking to someone the other day. I actually, I'm not, I get nervous about apologetics for various theological reasons. That word kind of makes me certain, certain nervous. But in some ways, I'm, I'm re, going back to my roots and finding renewed interest in apologetics in certain kinds of ways. Having said that, I, I've, I'm really believing that I think potentially, I'll talk some about this maybe tomorrow, but I think potentially maybe the best Christian apologetics in our day is presenting to a broken and fallen world what does it mean to be human in an inhumane world. Maybe I said something about that yesterday. But I, I, so those would be some of the questions. But I think what does it mean to be human? What do we think about our bodies? What does God think about our bodies? What does God think about the material world? It relates to the question before this one. Those are important. Eschatology and creation go together. And as Gerhardus Voss talked about, you can argue that eschatology precedes sin. Creation was made good, but it wasn't made final. It was going somewhere. God was doing something.
That's why shalom is not just a snapshot of a still picture. It is meant to grow and to flourish, and we're supposed to be fruitful and multiply. So that means we need a good view of creation, a robust view of creation, in order even to think about glory, and then in the middle to think about our Christian lives. Well, let's show our appreciation for Professor Pepe. A uh, little bit of housekeeping. Uh, we have until the next class will be at 11.15. Please ensure that you are in that classroom at 11.10. Uh, so it can actually start at 11.15, not start turning up at 11.15. You've got plenty of time to reflect together uh, over the riches we've received this morning. Uh, until that time, let me pray and we'll go to morning tea. Our great God and loving Heavenly Father, we thank you for this world that you have made to glorify your Son in, and we thank you that in the power of your Spirit, you have called us as sinners to be part of that glorification process. Father, give us delight in everything, in every way, in every day, for Jesus' sake. Amen. Amen.